your professor for this module is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in English and Master of Arts in Teaching English as a Second Language at Cebu Normal University, Cebu City, Philippines. He also finished his Doctor of Education, major in Educational Administration at the University of Visayas, Cebu City, Philippines. And also he finished the academic requirements leading to the degree Master of Arts in Special Education at Negros Oriental State University, Domaguete City, Philippines. A former OIC secondary school principal and state university professor at the College of Education and Graduate School, English program teacher also in Bangkok, Thailand, a part-time teacher at Ifugao State University under the cross-border education of St. Roberts International School and also a part-time professor at Philippine Christian University. At present, he is connected with KT South International School as a full-time faculty member in Vientiane, Laos, a well-rounded individual who has been invited to so many seminars, webinars in Asia, and of course, you know, way back in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, your e-professor for tonight, Dr. Lino Mondido. Your microphone, Doc. Your microphone is still muted. On. Is it okay? It's okay. It's okay. Do you hear me all, please, participants? Do you hear me now? Okay. Yes. How about my PowerPoint? Is it there? Yes, Doc. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Module 1, Foundations of Education. And I'm sure that those who are education graduates can really relate as much of this. But because of current trends and practices, we are going to insert something like the, the amid COVID-19. I would like to insert something, an instructional strategy, which is included in the philosophy of education, which can really help us in this time. Okay, I would like to start with points of ponder. This is according to John Dewey. Uh, you believe that education is a social process, it's growth, and as well, education is not a preparation for life because education is life in itself. That's according to John Dewey. However, according to Jose Calderon, a very known educator in the Philippines, once he said that it is an acquisition of knowledge skills, attitudes, values that make a person do better. It is not only a preparation for life, but it's life itself. So in other words, we teachers, we are going to find means and ways and means that we are going to, to capture the interests of our students, not only for learning the subject, but as well, they are, they are equipped with values, an attitude. So in other words, in teaching, we would like to go with value-laden teaching. All right, according to James also, Helen of Stanford University, 
it is an the instrument through which cultures perpetuate themselves. Okay. Now, according to John Lewis' views on education, progressive education is essentially a view of education that emphasizes the need to learn by doing. If you can still remember, this is those who are able to teach in Thailand, I think you can recall that one of the advocacies there is that teachers, foreign teachers would like to adopt the so-called learning by doing or what we call it uh, collaborative learning or it's uh, the students should be hands-on learning. So they are go given tasks to do and feel the, the need that after all, they are going to come up and they can use in their future lives. Thus, they will be believe that human beings learn through hands-on approach. That is what we call now learning by doing, all right? And this pragmatist belief, it's due with uh, uh, disposition that the reality must be experienced. So you know, uh, in this case now, if you are going to come up with lessons, there is a need for us to connect to real life. Okay. The purpose of education today, it's a pragmatic purpose. We call that we learn to work. If we are going to relate this to curriculum, it, the students are the center of the curriculum and the teachers are the doers of the curriculum. And I ensure these are only papers, but we need to realize that we are, we are the players of this curriculum schools use so we teachers we need to look into the progress of our students and today according to Misha Kitschil that education is being there to give us knowledge of our place in the world and the skills to work in it in which curriculum should always be revised to answer the needs of the time right and also it is underpinned by the specific political framework known as pragmatism, that is the advocacy of John Dewey. Okay, what do we expect as teachers in this foundations of education? Exactly, it is one is saving goals for schools and students is an important process in foundations of education. As teachers, Relating to this, we have also our goals and recall the Bloom's taxonomy, which is really fitting for this, that if you are going to set an objectives, these objectives are not only a requirement, are not only for compliance, that this could be an objective which our students would be guided what to do. So we need to input and we need to process and we have also output to come up with this number one. Number two, it helps to motivate people. If we're going to relate this, we teachers would always be motivating our students in the classroom. Because as mentioned, they're the center of curriculum. So then we are going to give justice of their coming to classes because they are really hungry of our teaching and the, in which they would learn from us. There is what they call the symbiotic process, learning from students, and students would learn from us. Also, it is also a good way to show the clear path to success. For student side, after all, if you are going to be very passionate in teaching, we can see what would be the end part of our teaching as far as education is concerned. However, it is imperative that school heads should work with teachers to develop a plan and mission for the school. We teachers are the players of the curriculum as, men as mentioned. And it is with us teachers to really engage more of the activities to realize what really is in the curriculum or in our planning for teaching. That is why it is expected 
that we are going to move forward. Your, your attendance in this webinar would help you so much to refresh your minds. In our job as a teacher, this is according to, to this other Sadkar and Silman. Okay, topic one, we would like to talk about foundations of education. Accordingly, this foundation of education provides an essential link between practice and theory. As mentioned by uh, Mr. Nico, he made mention of the lot of dimensions which would cover. And then when we talk about practice, it's our profession. How are we going to carry on our back our profession as educators? And the theory, what are the current theory? What are the practices that would be good for our teaching? Which beyond the book, beyond the curriculum, beyond research, we can really create. In that making of this, it would make effective reflection and decision making possible as teachers. Then number two, it would enhance the ability of educators with teachers to be reflective, decision makers to make effective use of conflict judgment and critical thinking. In, in such a way that we teachers, we should always be reflective in the sense that we should also consider the, the many factors of our learners. We cannot say that in one wink of our eye, our learners learn the best way, no. Learning takes time. Somehow, learning is painful. At the end, with our all efforts, preparation, preparing some materials, when we go to our classroom, what we expect cannot be carried over. It's normal because our students are not machine. They are not computers, so they are human beings. So judgment, though it will be complex, we should have to think it over. But we should also end up to critical thinking. If you can recall the Bloom's taxonomy, the two parts of the Bloom's taxonomy, the first, second, third, that's the lots, four, five, six, that's the hots. Lots means learning order, lower order thinking skills rather, and hots means higher order thinking skills. When we would like to come up with critical thinking, this is really in the higher level of Bloom's diagram. So we are not going to only stop, but we want students to be critical thinking that after all, they are ready for the battle of life to come. Number three, we, are, we educators should prepare for intelligent and responsible leadership. In short, our teaching would always be guided that we are dealing with students to become good citizens and they would be responsible. And if there are problems, they can really solve. Like now in the pandemic, there are issues on mental health. So if the students are ready, are equipped with some intelligent ideas and they are having the responsibilities, there's no reason why they cannot make an adjustment amidst the pandemic. All right, another one is but also guide us as educators careers for our teaching, research, administration, and policy making. I would like to quote on research now. I don't know if you have experience making an action research. An action research calls for problems of your subjects taught. You are going to find it out. What's the efficacy of your teaching of the subject? to really note down what would be some difficulties students face in your subject. So there is a need for you to really come up with the research, action research. This is really the, the reality or the happening in the classroom as we are teaching, okay? For it would help us understand what schools are alike. Are like. So, what I mentioned already, what current practices, what policies are really in our schools or in your schools now. And also how students learn at their own pace. So, 
I mentioned that it's not a compromised learning takes time. Sometimes it's painful. So students have our own pace of learning. We cannot pressure students to learn. We cannot force students to learn. And I do believe that learning is not a compromise and it takes time. Because according to John Dewey's law of learning, the, the law of practice, it says there, law of practice, meaning it's a law of practice means perfect. Practice means perfect. So it's Dewey's advocacy. Okay. And this foundation of education also, it would address some of the same topics, but focuses always on understanding. So meaning to say that if it all, a lot, a lot of dimensions, we would like to come up with how things became the way they are. Or if we are going to relate with our students, how the students be? Why are the students coming to our class? How are we going to cater them? Since they are coming from the different background, family background, status of the family, how are we going to do it? So the, the remedy, the intervention, that we are going to come up because it says also in strategy that it's not one size fits all. If you believe that the strategy is good for this particular class, it doesn't work with the other group of students. So it is not a one size fits all strategy or method. Okay, it is also an assumption that human beings, who they are and what they value are the driving force of education in the past and the present. So. Believing that students of ours have their background, we will consider them. We have also our own background, prior learning, prior knowledge that can really relate to the present time. Okay. Foundation of education, according to C. Calderon, it's a system of sciences upon which education stands and has its roots, origin, and basis. That is why part of the foundation of education, there's what they call historical, psychological, it's mentioned by Mr. Nico. So there are factors that affect the education, particularly in curriculum content. Now, in your case, I'm sure that you know what kind of curriculum are you using. First and foremost, before we teach, we should study the curriculum. Are you using the Cambridge curriculum? Are you using the Singaporean curriculum? Because if you would like, I, my experience is I ask other teachers in my class in Bangkok with the education students and the diploma and even the master's degree, I ask them, what curriculum are you using? Others cannot answer exactly. So we should know the curriculum because curriculum is our basis to develop our planning in the class. This is only a paper, as mentioned, but there are skills there. We cannot say that I don't know the curriculum because curriculum is the basis of exams. There are skills that can be used in the exams. Curriculum is guide. As mentioned also, we can teach beyond the curriculum, but teaching beyond the curriculum, we should also consider that we are not violating the laws of learning. So far, there are 12 laws of learning. I don't know if you can still recall. Let's find it out at all times that we can do anything under the heat of the sun in our classroom, but let's also find it out that we are not violating the laws of learning. So three laws of learning from Dewey is the, uh, the practice makes perfect, law of, the law of practice, law of effect, and the law of effect, practice, and I forgot the other one anyway. So there are three laws, uh, there are three laws of Dewey. So there are, these laws are part of the 12 laws of learning. There are added laws according to Salandanan and according to Fernand from the Philippines. They are professors in education. There are 12 laws that would include the three basic laws of John Dewey. But we should be guided with this in tandem with the Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. This is mentioned already that foundations of education are encompassing this part. 
psychological, anthropological, and sociological and foundations of education. And the part two, historical, philosophical, rather, and legal foundations for term two. This is in the term one and this is in the term two. Now, what are we doing here is we are capsulizing topics that could be applied in our classroom setup. We are not doing all because if we will do all, it would take one semester. So we are with topical, the important topics that can be applied in our teaching. So we don't mind uh, with two, we are particularly more on one, okay? Any violent reactions? All right, topic two, educational philosophies and branches. And its branches, okay. Now, mention that it set of values and beliefs about education that guide the professional behavior of educators, so teachers. We are also guided with educational philosophy. Aside from educational philosophy from a very known authors in education, very own philosophers, we should also create our own philosophy we, that we call it personal educational philosophy. I, I hope you have your own because believing that learners are coming in our classrooms diverse and from, uh, from different uh, parts in the, in the country, different parts in the society with different behavior. So we teachers, we are to model. I'm not saying that we are all perfect. No one is perfect, but at least we model the behavior. We, uh, notice that in the classroom, somehow we are disturbed or we are disturbed. These are the disruptive behavior. How are we going to deal with this? So applying the principles of classroom management. It gives importance and purpose also of education. All right, here, uh, schools, schools, of course. So there are, there are branches. One is suggestions from subject specialists. That is why schools have the heads, have the coordinators, have the, the great leaders. And, spe and specialists because they are in charge to, to equal what could be the needs of teachers and students in the classroom. Second one is studies of contemporary life. So what are studies, what are practices that can be applied, that can be merged in the curriculum development and planning of teachers? Another one is of psychology of learning, loss of learning mentioned already. So what are, what are the psychological effects of teaching? What do you expect from students? What do you want your students to do? What do you want your students to learn? What do you want to, uh, to evaluate? How are you going to do an evaluation? We cannot escape from evaluation because teaching without evaluation is not teaching. Evaluation is always part and parcel of teaching and learning process of teachers in the classroom. And of, of course, studies of learning, of learners rather, there are a lot of researches, so get in touch with conducted researches, read a bit of it, or if you have time, kindly, because there are practices that we can really get or adapt from conducted researches on education. They are, they are available online in Google, so you can find. So my advice is let's give time to, to read online researches which were conducted, and this can really help us. Okay, what do you believe are the ideas about education in action? It says there, what principles are demonstrated by your work in the classroom? According to Alison, what makes you proud to be a teacher? Perhaps you would say that I am not supposed to be a teacher, but there is no other choice. Here we go. So if you are going to classify that according to some dimensions of legal basis, you are only made, if that could be your lookout, you are only made a, being a teacher by chance because it's not your choice, it's your second choice, but there is no other choice I'll do to teach, but mainly I'm not happy. But even then, if you're not happy because you're in the vocation of teaching, do the best you can because teaching is an art. We can learn from many. We can really ask some other seasoned teachers that will help us also. 
What lets you know you've done a good job? What would determine that you are doing the best of your capacity? So in schools, you are observed by your heads. There are tools used to be for the observation. I'm not sure if all of you are observed by your heads. And after all, you are given the, the observation result, the tool use. And there is what we call the, the forum or the face-to-face -face between your boss. And they, they would like to come up with what is what have you done good? And what could be what could be the, the excellent part of your teaching and what points you are going to improve. Because for me, I mean I was a principal of the school. I had three bases in in the observation. In summary, I would like to come up with three. The, the part one is the excellent part of a teacher. Second part, the the points for improvement. And then the third part, what would what would a teacher do if a teacher is open for improvement? So there is what we call a just just a, a very very uh, heart to heart talk that we are in this vocation. We should move forward with our teaching styles. Okay, question. Okay, now what makes a teaching or a teaching a philosophy? Why are we going to know about foundations of education? Why are we going to know about the, the philosophies of education? The ism of education first, what shall we do with our, learn, with our learning styles or the learning styles of students? If teachers have styles of teaching, learners also have also their styles of learning. If you notice, and if you can recall, there are a lot of styles of learners, quadrant styles of learning or learners. Then beliefs about students. What do we believe? Are the students be here in our class to learn or our students are only in our class to sleep? What could that be? Beliefs about knowledge. So do you believe or do we believe that we, our students learn from us? Do we believe that our students memorize subjects, memorize lessons? Do we believe that we would like to write long, long writing on the board? And we would like to let our students copy on, on their notebooks and after all, nothing? Would it be working or not? And then beliefs about what is worth knowing. What is worth knowing on the part of a teacher, on the part of us, and on the part of the students? And then, what would be our personal beliefs in philosophical areas? As I said, it would be very nice if we would like to have our own personal belief or personal philosophy in life. So we would like to come up with the standard philosophy of education from different philosophers, and it would end up on teaching behavior. So what kind of behavior we should do? What kind of behavior we should eradicate? What kind of behavior we should improve so that our students will be benefited? Because everything we do, the target are the learners. Okay. Now, uh, philosophy, it provides educators, teachers, and curriculum makers with a framework for planning, implementing, and evaluating. In this case, we do the three. We are to plan before we teach, we plan. It's not good to teach that we are, have not planning. We have not done planning because teaching without planning is just, just like you are waking up in the morning after sleeping and nothing. So we should have to plan because it's part and then you are going to implement and, work and evaluate after all. And also this philosophy that we are going to whether you have your own philosophy, whether you would like to adapt from the different educators, it would help answer what schools are for, what subjects are important. We should also remember that we should think over, are we teaching content subjects? Are we teaching non-content subjects? 
So what shall I do if I'll be teaching uh, not non-content subject? Like if I am teaching social studies, what shall I do? If I am teaching computer, if I am teaching English, if I am teaching science, teaching math, what will I do as a teacher? So we should have to move forward and look forward. What are we going to do? So we are just like a horse with a horse blinder. We should have to look forward. So if we are going to look forward and we know students better, their background, we can make an adjustment. As I said, it's not one size fits all. What materials and methods should be used? Are you a teacher who is considered to be a top board eraser top? Are you a teacher that you are just going to the classroom, nothing? Are you a teacher that you are well prepared? Well, it depends on us, okay? If we are going to come up with the materials, importantly, what methods should go? Because it would also be parallel to the lesson that we plan. All right. In decision-making, philosophy also provides a starting point that will, will be used for succeeding decision-making. We can decide, like if our students do not learn, what will we do? If our objectives are not carried over, what shall we do? Shall we reteach? Shall we do another activity with the same objectives but different activities or whatever? And another thing is the philosophy of curriculum, the planner, the curriculum maker, the implementer, the evaluator. It would also reflect his or her life experiences, beliefs, social and academic background and education. So we teachers, we are at the same time the planner, we are an implementer, we are an evaluator. So we, sh we are doing a multitasking. So others would say it's not easy. Well, if it's our routine and we will have to take it easy with all our passion, with all our love, there's no reason why we cannot make it. Okay, I'm talking about on COVID-19 issues, which is really affecting all of us globally. Okay. Now, according to Dr. Inoshan from Cebu Normal University in the Philippines, there is best instructional design that can help in this time of crisis, in the pandemic. He mentioned about conditioning, organizing, visualizing, interacting, and demonstrating. And according to him, COVID-19 is not only a pandemic, but an instructional design with five dimensions, essential phases or dimensions to use in your instructional modules or in instructional planning, both online and offline. Okay, I would like to remind each of you that I am not to talk all. I would only consider in this kind of module, module one, I would relate or connect to conditioning, number one, phase or number one dimension. Now, conditioning, teaching techniques for COVID-19 instructional model. According to Dr. Inoshan from Cebu Normal University, he stressed about songs, arts and crafts, films and videos, news report. I'm very sure that all of us are very familiar with this and we are using this in our classes. It's not only English, because some English teachers would say, or some other teachers would say that songs are only for English. No, for me, no. I'm sorry to say no. It can be used across the discipline. Arts and crafts as well. Others would say, I'm not good in drawing. Well, if you are not good in drawing, if there are teachers in your school good in drawing, you can use him as your resource speaker, probably. You can ask him or her a follow-up if there could be output of students. 
So it's just a matter of collaborating. Another one, films and videos. I would like to remind, if you are going to use film and videos, these are very concrete, according to the latter experience in, in teaching. But we teachers, we should be reminded that films, videos should be watched by ourselves first before we are going to, to play this or use this in the classroom. We are going to view this in one week. It's not that you are going to have the video this evening and tomorrow you will play without, without looking at it, watching on it, reviewing on it. Or if you know how to edit, maybe you can edit because there are some parts in the videos or films not good for the age level of your students or our students. All right, for the news report, this can be very common and we can use a newspaper or you can use some, if the students have their connectivity on, on, their, on their, at home, they can really come up in the internet news online. That can help. Now, I can remember that one teacher in social studies, every Monday, his routine is to come up with news reporting. And after the news reporting, they are, they are going to come up with brainstorming, and which is what very good. It's not only in news reporting that after the news would say no more, but there are other variations a teacher was employing to, to come up with the, the whole time a movement in the class. Conditioning techniques, shortly or importantly, can help. And then if you are going to relate to Lehman's term, conditioning technique is a kind of a motivation that we are going to, to let our students ready before a proper or lesson proper. So I hope that this kind of COVID-19 instructional model would help us. Okay. According to the author's discussion of the instructional model, including and nurturing the arts is one of the ways to prevent depression. I like the line. So by drawing, by whatever would be part of the arts that the teacher is doing, it would, it would help prevent depression, the mental issues in this pandemic. Singing is one of the ways to cope unpleasant emotions. Maybe then emotions probably, this can really help singing. Others like me, I would say that I love singing, but songs do not love me. But if you, have, if you are really good at singing, why not singing in your class? The a cappella, okay. Making videos and watching it increases self-worth and abreasting oneself to the new make, to the news make us prepared for the eventualities during this pandemic. This is from Dr. Rinaldo Inushan, my very good friend from Cebu Normal University. Cebu City, Philippines. All right, let's move on to the five branches of philosophy. The first one is what we call the metaphysics. Metaphysics is related to what we call a curriculum truth because philosophy or foundations of education one of the advocacies of philosophy of education is that we teachers, we should always consider curriculum. Curriculum is our main tool in teaching. That's why I said that before we teach in a year or in a semester, or if we are new teacher, or to those who will be teaching new teacher in the profession, welcome to our profession, kindly ask your heads to a curriculum that will be used in your teaching. Because if you would say that there is no curriculum, very impossible, education or teaching cannot be without curriculum. It's a truth. Second one is we call it epistemology. It's knowing methods. We teachers would also know the triadic mode of teaching. 
I am sure you can still recall the triadic mode of teaching. Simply, it's called teaching strategy. A teaching strategy has three components, has three dimensions, because basically, if we are going to say teaching strategy, it is exactly what we call the general view. So what, what methods? So the first one in triadic mode of teaching, teaching strategy is approach down to methods, and last is techniques. So if you would like to come up with approaches, what particular approaches are you using in your class? If you are teaching math, what approach? If you are teaching science, what approach? If you are teaching English, what approach really are you using? In that, if you are to determine the approach that you would use, what method? If you are teaching science, what approach and then the method you will use is laboratory method, experimental method. If you are you teaching English, you are using grammat uh, grammatical transformation. What would be your method? If you are teaching travel and tourism, you are using outcome-based approach. What would be your method? And after determining the method, what would be your techniques? Because in the techniques, you will also consider the learning styles of our students in, in consonant with our teaching styles. We have different teaching styles and students have different learning styles. We cannot assume that our students learn this way and other students should be also this way now. It would be very impossible. And however, if you would like to relate this with the three philosophical foundation of education, with our beliefs, it says there that if you will say what is real in teaching, we would consider ontology. And what is true is epistemology. So in other words, for number two now, what is really true? What practices are we going to use? And if you are going to move on to number three, anxiology and ethics, which calls for the character and values, it says also in the foundation dimension, what is good? What is good is number three, and I would like to repeat, by the way, number two is what is true, and number three, what is good? And number four, it is anxiety and aesthetics, what is, what art, literature, yourself, ourselves, students themselves, and the fifth one is logic, how curriculum is organized, how curriculum is used, how do we interpret curriculum? You cannot say that I do not like this scale because it's difficult. I want this scale because it's okay. I'll get from the internet because this is easy and I will teach you. Basically, if you are going to get into in the internet, there's nothing wrong for that. But it has also confirmed with the curriculum. Does your thing use in the internet parallel to the curriculum that you're using? Does it fit? to the learners in our classroom because getting from the internet, there is what we call cultural free. The, the, this material is used in the other countries in the world and it doesn't fit with your students. Reason, it's difficult. And what will we do as teachers? We will modify. We are going to modify that would fit with our learners. For example, if you are talking about Apple, this is only a sample, but you are, are teaching in a mountainous school and your school students in your school does not or do not even experience or do not have the time to taste an apple. So that could be difficult. Even if you bring a real fruit, apple still, why not changing that to other fruits which are really reachable in the community where the students are. So let's be concrete because according to the ladder of learning, we should always be concrete in teaching, not abstract, probably. So not only use pictures of Apple, but because there are fruits available in the market, we should buy day before so we can present the, what we call in strategy, the realia, real objects, okay? Now, topic three is we would like to talk about philosophies of teaching, teacher-centered or student-centered. 
I'm sure you have in mind what could be teaching-centered and what could be student-centered. I'm sure. Okay. Teacher-centered ed educational philosophies. One is this is this is other other teachers, other students would call this ism in education. Ism in, in foundation of education is true. Now, perennialism is to teach students to think. We teachers, we should also consider that we teach because we want the students to think. According to Bloom's taxonomy, we are going to, cut, to develop our students to become a critical thinker in the end. So as teachers with the six dimensions and levels of blooms, we should mix. I'm not saying that when we teach, we should consider the six level now. We should get from the hearts level and mix it with the last level. Like if we are going to make an exam, we are not going to give only true or false because exams should be varied. That would start from, from the very easy one to the most difficult. However, if we are going to come up also in questioning techniques, because according to Socrates, we need also to develop our students, how students would answer the question. It's not only the WH, basic WH, but how about the H and the if you were. In other words, Bloom's taxonomy have many purposes or it can be used for questioning technique and it can be used for designing exam. It can be used for evaluation of students. So Bloom's taxonomy would be our best guide. Let's make it our baby. Second one is in the teacher center is the essentialism. This essentialism is also considered the most conservative of all the schools of thought in the foundation of education. Ideas and skills are actually basic to a culture and should be taught to all alike by time-tested methods. By so doing, we teachers, we should consider that there are a lot of time-tested methods Time-tested methods are methods which were used before are coming to this advocacy of teaching and up to the time it is used. So meaning to say that methods long, long ago can be used at this moment of, of time. They are time-tested methods. That is why in the triadic mode of teaching, teaching strategy, there is what we call the method in the diagram, in the triangle. There are thousands, even billions of methods it would depend on a teacher which, because I, will, I would like to repeat, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Now, this essentialism also is considered most conservative, again, in the schools of thought. Okay. Behavior reason is also one. The classroom environment can have a large effect on how students will behave. And reinforcement plays another important role in behaviorism. I can relate with this with the uh, talking system, rewards, and reinforcement, not punishment. And I hope you are not adapting that, like if students cannot answer questions, you will like your students to stand until the bell rings, not applicable in the 21st century of teaching. It's punishment. So let's try to really transform punishment into rewards and reinforcement, token system. But if you would like to come up with a token system, if you will get something, sit it also, consider what level you are teaching. Like candies are not good for children. 
like chocolate probably are not good for children. Think, what would that be? Token systems should not also be abused. Should not be used every day. But if you have a lot of money, well, do it every day. But again, my advice is do not use it because it might be very abusive. Students do not even participate in discussion because there is no reward, like you give something, items, whatever would that be. Positivism, this is one of the uh, mentioned centered teaching. The teacher's job to make sure directions are clear and students understand what and how they will be learning. So practically in this case on positivism, there is just like a teacher is very autocratic, lesser in democratic way. So for me, I would rather use this probably once in a year. Now for student-centered educational philosophies of all the school of thoughts, one is progressivism. Now progressivism, according to some educators, it is labeled as most liberal than most conservative. Progressivism believes that change is occurring and should be embraced rather than ignored. Practically, if students are called to answer, and students, and we believe that the answer of the students will not be correct as what you, you think or we think, we should always consider and appreciate because approval to students' answer is considered human nature. So we are not going to ignore it. Or behavior, disruptive behavior in the class, we are not going also to ignore. We should try to find means as a teacher what to do because if students are doing uh, disruptive behavior or doing any behavior in the class that is really negative, it is the, the responsibility of a teacher. It's not the responsibility of the head of the school that they are going to bring in the office. No, it should, it should start from us. Everything should start from us. Second one is humanism. Students feel comfortable to share their thoughts, feelings, beliefs, fears, and aspiration with each other and self-actualizing. I would like to talk on self-actualizing first. It's according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is the last level, highest level. Students come to class, students come to learn, students come to school because they need to be self-actualized in the end, that they would be professional like us. In this case, we teachers should have also this way that we should also feel like, like what happened that most uh, schools like in the Philippines now are really in the virtual teaching. So this would, it would be very, it would be very difficult, but it's find a way that we, students feel comfortable because if we are going also to pressure students that it's in the pandemic issue, and then we would like to have the tight schedule of this virtual, I don't know if learning takes place. So we should also consider their feelings. So being human might be, or it should be understanding after all. The third one is reconstructivism. Again, this liberal and all the schools of thought. Now reconstructionism focuses on student experience and taking social action on real issues, such as violence, hunger, inequality. Students are taught how to deal with ultimately fix these issues, like now in pandemic. So if our students in the classroom, if we are going to connect our lessons with the pandemic, and then giving them some positive thought about the pandemic, not more on negative, not more on blaming, because I'm sure that there is or there are already mental issues on this. It would add up trauma to our students. So we should bring our students to like the happier moments in our class because it's not, it's not easy for the young, especially our students who are so young yet and they are not very receptive to pandemic issues. So we should try to really let them, their minds open up or they should have to open up sharing rather than forcing them to, to, to do. Okay, okay, if they're going to share, all right. Let's, let's also make any uh, positive 
comment or positive probably like reaction because these students of ours are also suffering from this time of crisis. Now, constructivism, it emphasizes developing personal meaning through hands-on activity based on teaching and learning. So this is, this is really, I would say that others are not important. This is also very important, the most important of all. Like we want our students to learn by their own hands-on learning, but we should also supervise. It doesn't mean that if you're going to use hands-on approach in teaching, we should also only say, okay, look, you do there, and nothing, not. There is also a close monitoring and guidance from us teachers. So this is from Dr. Grace, Education for the Philosophy of Education. All right, I think I give this already. All right, there are five dimensions of learning relating to the foundations of education. If you would like to come up with declarative learning, it's the one. If you, if you are to use this in the question and answering techniques that students would like to answer WH, fine. If that could be procedural, procedural learning, the how? So this might be difficult for our students, but well, not all, but maybe most. So we should expose our students to the how and the if you were questions. Unconditional learning, when and where, okay? And the reflective learning, the why. This is where we are going to stress most of the time, the why approach. And the metacognitive learning, the how to learn. So with teachers, we should also be very sensitive with these dimensions of learning. So we can really adjust which of this, which of this and what could work well and what could not work well in our teaching as far as students are concerned. There are, in relation to that slide is, there, is, there are also kinds of achieving targets. What are we going to target or goal? What is our goal? Foundation of Education says that we teachers should have goal targets in teaching, not only that the objectives, but what else we should do in order to concretize teaching with our students. So the master factual and procedural knowledge, what students need to do or to know. This is like, if it's just like the IPO method, the input, the process and the output approach. So what are you going to, what we want our students to know in our lesson, what we want to know in our objectives, because objectives guide what the students should do. If they are able to do, what, what else after all? If they are able to locate, what else after all? For example, if you are a social studies teacher, you are not using GLOBE and MAP to, to back up your teaching and you are talking about countries in the world, countries in Asia, it would be very good if we are back, having a backup with using the globe and the, the map because there might be a difference using the globe and the map. So after all, students can weigh which could be easier for them. So we are going to expose both. So when I was ahead of the school, I always advised your studies teachers to come up with these two materials, both the globe and the map. And then no outright versus the via the reference. And in, in short, is how are we going to come up with our materials? What what would be what would be our materials on hand? What could be references? Are we using references, current references? Are we using the old reference in 1990s, 1920s? So there are a lot of references online that can, can back up with our lesson. All right. Open stated with words, notes, lists, names, defines. If you can relate this, we can find, we can have this as the objective probably. And these are really the verbs in the Bloom's taxonomy. All right. Secondly is the reasoning targets. What would be, what would be our reason for having this lesson? What would be our lesson, I rather reason for having these materials? What would be our lesson for having this kind of activity? If you cannot finish the, the activity, what shall we do? 
Okay, so this is more on thinking proficiency using knowledge to solve a problem, make a decision and plan. We would like to, to bring up our students to solving problems, right? How, are, how these students would be ready so that after all in their lives, they are ready to, to face problems. Okay. This uh, represent mental process that as predicts in fears, classifies hypothesis, compares and others. So this would also, again, these are the, the very vocabulary words. These are the verbs found in the Bloom's taxonomy. Our reference would be Bloom's taxonomy for this. Performance targets. If you would like to talk about performance targets, we should also consider per teacher's performance and student performance. Everything should start from the teacher. We cannot expect student performance if a teacher does not perform well. So Pewis learning targets must be demonstrated and observed. That should be seen, heard, and to be assessed chronologically, sequentially, okay? Examples of this, the oral fluency in reading. If our students do not know how to read, our elementary kids do not know how to read, partly we are to be blamed. So what shall we do with this? What intervention program? What intervention strategies are we going to, to use for this? So we can remediate the, the deficiency of the non-readers, the halters, the reader, the reader word for word, or a playing musical instrument. If you're a music teacher, what particular instrument that you are going to use? If there are no musical instrument available in the school, what you will do? All right, demonstrating movement skill in dance. If you are a PE teacher, if you're a dance teacher, how would you like to, to model the steps? You are not going to say that, okay, so this dance now cannot. There must be a lecture method before a practical method. Then serving a valuable. How are we going to, to teach serving a valuable? If we are, if we are a, a PE teacher, we are not going to say through the ball, but there are processes there starts with the lecture and then after all the practical or the laboratory method, which would be the actual uh, demonstration of students using that kind of ball that you expect. Right, topic four, philosophical foundations of education. The traditional, we are also talking about the conservative, most liberal, most conservative. These are also classified according to traditional and contemporary. The traditional educational philosophies or the schools of thought, first one in traditional is realism, idealism, perennialism, essentialism. These schools of thought or these philosophies do not mean that these are not really usable. We can use this. There are a lot of practices here. There are a lot of theories that can be applied in our teaching. So much with contemporary, pragmatism, progressivism, critical theory, reconstructionism, behaviorism, constructivism, humanism, connectionism. We can get a lot of this here. This could be our tool use this as our tool. We can, there are available online on Google's. We should all somehow consult this kind of philosophies because there are a lot of guides here that can really help us uh, expand our lesson, make our lessons concrete, make our teaching concrete. So after all, it would benefit with our learners. Topic five, summary of educational philosophies. Now, according to the educational philosophies, behaviorism says that people, actions are driven by a need to gain rewards, reinforcement or avoid punishment. See, punishment is not Letting students to stand, if the students cannot answer, not anymore. Letting students go out, if a students are, are doing negative actions in the classroom, not good. 
putting a coconut husk on the head of the students standing in front, it's a shame. It's a kind of walk of shame. So that should not be. So according to behaviorism, we teachers would like to come up with reinforcement otherwise, as mentioned, the talking system. If it is meant to increase a good behavior, it's like a reward that if you are going to, to do, it would increase a good behavior because the more negative, it would be also be the more outcomes negative. So behaviorism says that. Now in behaviorism, there are two subcategories. Repeating is reinforcement and punishment. Punishment can be positive, we all knew this, and the negative. It is one that involves giving the student something he should does not want. So it's positive punishment. All right, negative punishment is one that involves something or taking away something the student does want. Okay, so I hope that with this kind of philosophy, we're enlightened that we should try to turn positive punishment or rather negative punishment to positive. It's always one thing there to be happy is just practically is, it's just like you are using, uh, you are using a rubber band approach. Stretch the rubber band, it will still go back. It will take a long time to, to reach to its last elasticity limit and it would destroy. So perhaps a rubber band technique can be advisable. It's just like stretching a rubber band. Now, in constructivism, it says that people construct knowledge through their experiences and interactions in the world. Converting this to student part of the students, if we are going to call our students and students are not ready to answer, of course, they cannot give the answer. So let it be. Because secondly, or in the second phase of calling the students, they are might be ready and they would answer. So we cannot force students to do. Another one is experiential learning is more powerful than lectures and, and worksheets. This is where students can share the experiences they are given. Uh, it's just like freedom for them to, to share. Without much ado, the students can really give a lot more about their lives and experiences. Another one part of it is social learning. This learning through interactions with other people. Most effective form of social learning doesn't come from the teacher interactions with students, but from students' interactions with other students. This is what we call it S plus S, students plus students interaction. They are more comfortable going or giving reactions going to other students because they are of the same age. They are comfortable sharing, talking. That is why talking somehow it's overused where they can learn because they believe that if they are going to interact with their the same age, they would learn more and they're gonna have more encouragement rather than for the teachers because maybe the, the students will say that the teacher is so strict and I have limitation to share, that could be difficult. All right, the next one is project-based learning, the very known PBL. This PBL is also one of the best approaches that can help us in all subject across the discipline. Students work in groups to figure out the problem. It's a collaborative learning, working with other students. Students are encouraged to figure out the solution based on their own understanding of the world and the topic. Now, if we are going to use the PBL, especially if we are going to have the groupings, we should always consider to give or provide a teacher-made scoring guide. We call it, we call it, teacher made rubrics because it would be very easy to evaluate group work, especially if they are to present that you are breaking down points, what you want the students to do. 
so that when students are guided with your rubrics or teacher made scoring guide, they would know, they would also adjust the, the way they are going to present because the student scoring guide is already given or provided. However, if you are going to adopt or use the scoring guide, give the scoring guide ahead of time. For example, next week you would have this kind of activity and then you are still in brainstorming and you want your students to present by groups. You can give this time the scoring guide or the teacher's rubrics so that they would be very skillful to do an adjustment because the scoring guide is there for them. Okay. The third one is the critical theory or we call that reconstructionism. It is about how our educational system can best offer education to all people. I can relate this to the IFA, the education for all, that we have no right to say no to students who would like to enroll, even criminals, and they, their cases are already dismissed, and they are going back to normal, and they are to enroll in our school, and you are in the enrollment committee, you would say that this student was once a criminal, cannot. You try to do research, whether cases are dismissed and they are back to normal, they have the right for education. We cannot say no. So education is said that it's life. So people or students would like to learn because according to Maslow, hierarchy of needs, they want to become self-actualized people in the end. They want to become professional and they want to become good citizen of the country. Second one is this philosophy, reconstructionism, list out in education and what schools and teachers can do to believe in all types of students. So diverse students mentioned already that our students are coming from different family background, different family status. So our, we need to adjust, do an adjustment. We are not doing having students like homogeneous grouping, even the homogeneous groupings. I experienced when I was teaching in the Philippines in high school, I handled almost five years in homogeneous grouping. Even if they are classified as homogeneous in one class, still there could be many, not, not many, but a few who would emerge to be slow in learning. But as, of, as in this uh, 20, 21st century learning, it, we come up with heterogeneous grouping. Because in heterogeneous grouping, it's uh, really what they call inclusive. There is a law in the inclusive education that this can be part where all the types of learners be mixed. But, but there are still other schools. I don't know in your schools if you are teaching, if still your director is, is doing, or if your principal is doing the, the homogeneous grouping. But when I was the head of the school, I did the heterogeneous groupings because I believe there were there are rather this advantages for that. In fact, there, there could be disadvantages, but I look forward for advantages. All right, despite in the absence of technology to other schools, this fear recognizes that people come into schools with different advantages and disadvantages and focuses on how well, every student achieve their potential. Even students are not good, even if they are slow, still they have their potentials. Let's harness the student's potential. If you still recall in the strategies of teaching, there is the acronym there that is SAFE. What, are, what could SAFE be? Being an acronym, SAFE S stands for slow learning or slow learners. S A stands for average learners. F stands for fast learners. E stands for excellent learners. So we should consider all the time that our students in the classroom are safe by acronym, but not by label. 
because it's not good to put a label with our students that would say, oh, those students at the side are slow learners. No, these students here in front of me are bright or at stand up bright students come to me because it will be a leader, not for me. I don't like that kind of idea because it's something like uh, we are creating a republic in our classroom and it would not be good. It's this, there is a disadvantage for that. Okay. Humanism. It is a branch of psychology related to the theories of Abraham Maslow's and Carl Rogers that says people want to grow and fulfill their ultimate potential. See that? That humanism always positive, that people, students come to class because of their potentials. If their potentials are lesser than those who are in our class as well, they have time to harness it. Okay, we're in self-directed learning here. It involves students learning what they want me to learn, not what the teacher definitely decides is important. In other words, as teachers, we need to adjust our lesson. Well, we are guided with the curriculum, we are, gu we are guided with our planning, but it doesn't mean that teaching a, a lesson is only one wink of an eye of students that students learn. It takes time. So what we do, if the objectives are not measured, if the objectives are not carried, simple. The simple thing to do is reteach. This is always advice. I always advise my, my co-teachers before when I was the head of the school that when, when you believe that the objectives are not carried, reteach the same lesson, the same objectives, but different activities. It's not that you are going to teach the same lesson, the same objectives, the same activities. We should have to look into another activities that would back up as intervention, right? Self-directed learning is the passion for a subject will motivate students to learn, which is true. So we, in this kind of learning now, we are guided that in teaching, we need to do adjustment as much as possible. The fifth one is informational processing. Theory of learning says that and information to the world around us moves from sensory storage to working memory to long-term memory. I think you believe the differences between short-term memory and long-term memory, that this information that our students will forget, even they are young, they would still forget. For example, if you are going to say, students, what's our lesson yesterday? What was our lesson last week? They cannot recall. And then if the students cannot recall, we might be upset. Well, just smile. We should just smile because according to philosophy, we cannot force students to, to learn. They have the right to think. They have the time to think because learning takes place in the right time. All right, if everything works well, it will move to long-term memory, which is really just memories that are stored for a person to access later. See that? So uh, we cannot expect that students are all alert to answer questions from us. In fact, if we are going to ask questions normally, students will answer only one word. But answering one word in strategies is not acceptable. We should always guide our students to answer in complete sentence that there must be a very simple part, element, subject, and the verb, because answering one question is, we call it expletive. It's not complete. So we would try them to, to answer completely as much as possible. All right. Specific learning involves storing and accessing information in memory. That is why if students' memory is not ready, students cannot access, it's just like computer. When a student can, can get information from working memory to long-term memory, they can become overloaded. True. All right, cognitive overload involves too much information in working memory and being able to remember anything. Right, this is just like if, if we give a lot of tasks, I don't know if you used to give a lot of tasks, a lot of assignment, a lot of lot of activities. I don't know what did you observe with your students? Because there are classes who would like 
more activities under our classes who would like lesser activities. I don't know how you will adjust that as far as this philosophy is concerned. Right, the sixth one is Jepersonalism. This is a philosophy based on Thomas Jefferson's beliefs and writing. Deals on its two ideals of education, the inclusive education and the citizen education. Inclusive education is a law. I, I mentioned this as there is a law inclusive education. This is where the, some of these difficulties students with learning disabilities are merged. For example, students with mild autism, students with mild retardation, students with mild, uh, I mean, blind, blindness probably, or, or students with special needs. By the way, in, 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 the, in the law of inclusive education, it's not, it's not, it's not the deficiency first, it's people's first. So it should be students with difficulties. We cannot say uh, special students, students with special needs or special needs students, students with difficulties, students with autism. Now, these students in the inclusive education, they are merged in the classroom. I'm not sure if you are, if your classroom has students with this kind of difficulties. The true idea of this one, if we have students with special needs in our classes, we teachers, we need to design another activity, the same lesson with different activities for the students with special needs to answer because special needs, students with special needs could be both slow in advance. There are, student, there are students with special needs who can do well. There are students with special needs who can do, do tasks, but very slow. So it will depend, but we are not going to put a label with these students, even if the students have the doctor's prescription or, or doctor's narration probably, or doctor's result, we still consider this as students being just normal in our classes. And they are going to put in the class, meet with the other students, as we said, regular students, so that these students will be encouraged to learn. However, one of the, the techniques here to do is we should use the body-body system approach. We would like to look into who our students can really coach or give time to, to just a tutor because if you are going to use students at, like at his or her age, they would feel or he or she would feel comfortable. So let's find means and ways if you have. So try, if you have students with special needs in your classes, try to find this way to come up with activities, just design activities sim simpler than the other group of students. The same lesson, but different activities. If you are going to give one to 20 activities for the other group of students, probably you can only give two or one. It depends on the difficulty of your special needs. So try to find it out. Okay, citizens of edu education, of course, we want them to bring up, to become good citizens of the country, right? This kind of philosophy emphasizes on the application of these ideas of teaching and learning today. This is like in the pandemic issues, we would like to come up with this one. Now, those teachers who are doing the virtual or the online learning, Perhaps you can also use any of the philosophies. It will depend on you. Now, one of the key ideal of Depressionism is that everyone has the right to education. That's true. We call that also in the IFA, education for all. 
everyone has the right. Inclusive education, because it's about including everyone education, especially with children with special needs. Schools should educate students on how to be good citizens, a concept known as citizen education. Okay. Pragmatism. Pragmatism is an educational philosophy that says education should be life and growth. Okay. If, if we are going to relate this in practical view as teachers, if we are going to teach, we should be energetic, we should be lively, we should be ready with all wearing the smiles, not unbecoming, all right? No problems, even if we have problems, we should have to leave it at home. Once we go out from our doors, door, after, after that is problem is no more, right? Because we need to be all smiling, going to the classroom, okay? Teachers should be teaching students things that are practical for life, encourage, guide students to grow into better people. So that is why I made mention with this, that lessons should be connected to real life. Like now, how are we going to, to connect lesson to these pandemic issues? And we should see to it that it should not trigger trauma with our students as far as mental health issues are concerned. So that after all these students of ours still be better and happy students in the end. It says also that the idea of practical learning should apply to the real world of teaching learning process. Practical applications of this lesson is very much important. Try to, to connect your lesson in real world, in real life. Just switch in a moment of time that probably will say, learners or students, what if? Blah, blah, blah. It's up to how you'd like to connect. That, that after all, students will share their ideas. Another key component to pragmatism is experiential learning, which is just a fancy way of saying that education should come through experience, which is correct, right? It's a difference in learning ideas versus learning through practice. Okay, I mentioned already that what we teach in the class, what the students learn in the class, according to the philosophy, it's really after all that these students can use them in the real lives, can use them in the real experience of life. All right, experiential learning is all about practice and figuring out how to discover knowledge through experience. Okay, with, it, with this, uh, with it, the prior knowledge of our students, plus their experiential learning from in the class, learning with the other uh, students in the class, that could really be a point that they can really make a whole thing true. All right, John Dewey and many other famous educators were pragmatists. They really like in pragmatism. All right, perennialism. In education, it is an idea that school curricula should focus on what is everlasting. As mentioned, curriculum is just a paper. We are a doer of the curriculum. We are the implementer of the curriculum. What students learn in the curriculum through our teaching, through our planning and implementing, that will be everlasting. One common uh, example of this is when your student, when you can meet your student, or when you can meet a group of students, they would talk to you, teacher, what you taught us, we use this in university. Thank you very much for, that, for those lessons. So the students would not snub at us. They would just give the smile. The teachers were so happy because most of your lessons are really useful in our undertakings now in the university.
or you can receive email of thanks. It's just like more than money in our pocket. It focuses on things also that have lasted for many years. True. It is also one of the cornerstones of perennialism is the concept of evergreen ideas or philosophies that last through many generations. It can be even handed down to their children. They would like to share to their families if they have their fam families of their own. They can really coach their kids. If they are really in, in schools, they would share that, oh, we, we have this lesson before and our teachers say this way. Okay, the belief is that ideas that have stood the test of time have proven themselves to be worthy of study. It's just like methods, time-tested methods. Still, what the father, what the mother learned during their high school days or university days still can be learned by their kids. And I said, they can really coach. They, can, they are a very good coach or tutors for their kids at home. Why? They learn a lot from us. Again, it's more than money in our pocket. Progressivism says that the idea that education comes from the experience of the child. It's actually that still an experience. American educator Dewey was a key figure in progressivism. John Dewey is very popular. Even me, uh, I, I always consider a lot of theories and practices of or dimensions of John Dewey. Dewey believed that learners should experience democracy in school to make them better citizens. Instead of having all-knowing teachers standing in front and talking, right? All-knowing teachers standing in front and talking. Therefore, learners themselves should be an active part of their education. It, uh, I, I believe that teaching is not a one-man show. So we should always involve learners in the process. We should give time learners to share. We are not going to talk the whole period of our teaching. It's not a monopoly of knowledge because teaching is not a monopoly of knowledge. We should always consider that students are part of learning because it's, as I said, it's not a one-man show. It's not only a talking of the teacher that after all, students do not learn anything. And then they would always say, yes, 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 all over. Another major part of progressive essay is teaching the whole child, meaning to say the holistic view, holistic development of learners. It's from the head to the tip of the toes, or if you can remember the edge, edge of a child, the edge, hand, head, and the heart. That learners to become good citizens, not just good learners. It's in this kind of school of thought in which active learning says that education revolves around the learners is a major tenet of progressivism, but it's not only one. So we would always believe that more heads are better than one. That is why our students would like to become engaged with other students in the class. They will be talking so much, somehow, the talking is not part of our lesson. But even then, there is learning after all. This, it depends on us how to guide them. So our guidance would be a call for these kinds of learners. So to become learners in a straightforward. Realism. Realism is a philosophy started by the ancient Greek writer Aristotle. If you can remember Aristotle, it's, there. it's a very uh, good Greek writer. It states that there is a true reality and things exist whether humans perceive them or not. So if, if we are going to 
practically relate this to our students in the classroom. If students do not learn, okay. I don't know if you will be satisfied. And then if you will say, students, do you have questions? They do not have questions. But after all, they will say, in, in the exam, teacher, you did not discuss this. You did not mention this in our class. What shall we do so? It is also said that if we are going to come up with our test, it is not good to give a test that is not taught, that is not discussed. Somehow, we we'll probably give, well, you can give, give one just to test the ability, but if it, that could be more, that is not good because the, the students do not have a prior knowledge of that lesson, and then it's it's really included in the exam, in the evaluation. What if students got zero? And if students got zero, remember in the practical view, we are to be blamed. We are part of the zero result of our students, meaning to say that students do not learn anything. And if you would say, if you would give the reason that, oh, I taught well, I prepared well, well, there is nothing wrong with preparation, but the, the, the thing there is that the students are not learning lessons taught. Okay. So here, educational realism says that it's the belief that we should study logic, critical thinking, and scientific method to teach students to perceive and understand reality. So we can recall our logic subject before when we were still, and then also bringing up students to become political thinker, and then scientific method, how students would like to solve problems. Science teachers are very familiar with this, math teachers giving problems, asking data, how what data is asked in the problem, what kind of solution is used, what mathematical operation can be used, why this mathematical operation is used, how this mathe mathematical operation is used to solve the problem, what this experiment for, what are, why are we doing this kind of experiment, what can this be for, what is the, the benefit of this experiment, all right? If a science teacher does not use or does not employ experiment in teaching science, I don't know. For me, is I don't, I don't believe in that. That is why when I was hitting a school, I would always inspect the, the data notebook of the teacher because I want to say, I want to see what kind of experiment is used. And then I'm very particular on the conclusion. I want to say how students formulate the conclusion because I don't like that the students would say, therefore I conclude, I don't accept that. So I, I would always say, please uh, help students to just give declarative sentences before concluding. Well, I, I'm not saying that if a student would say, therefore I conclude it's wrong, but I don't like it because I want students to formulate some statements before the concluding part. That is how I, I advise science teachers before in my tutelage. And this is also in this kind of school of thought or philosophy, there is what we call the inquiry method. By nature, is the only thing that's important in realism, but it's about finding true reality, true logical process. So the real life, the reality in life, problems, problems are normal because there is no one in this world without problem. But the point is, what can we do or how shall we do? How shall we make our students ready to face problems, to face reality in the future? That is part of our lesson teaching in the classroom. That in the end, it's not only learning subject from agreement, but when problems arise in their way of living, in their own family in the future, they are ready to find solutions. They would not like to go back to their parents. They would not like to go back to their mother to come up. Okay, so in other words, I would end up with my, my sharing here. Thank you very much.
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lina Mondido. Do you have questions or should you want to, you know, um, share something related to the topic? Any question, Madam Charisma? <laughs> we have teachers in Lao International Schools who are participating right now. I would like to thank my good teachers, Charisma, my student in master's degree, Jaime Cigarino, and the other teachers. Thank you so much for participating. Sorry, Dr. Nico, I'm interrupting you. No problem, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're not giving me signal, but I yeah, give you a time. I'm also from Tassel Coach Master Incorporated, everybody is welcome because as what humanism is into, like um, every human being wanted to grow and in order to fulfill, you know, their potential. So for those who really wanted to learn and to refresh themselves, then TCM is for them. <laughs> and anyway, now it's already like around 12, 12.35 in the Philippines and 11.35 here in some parts of Asia, but still we are all alive. We are all alive. Thank you very much. Participants, I hope that you have learned, refresh, it refresh your minds. I hope so. Now, can we have some questions or um, if you wanted to ask some pieces of advice from our equal paper, could you possibly um, shoot your questions right now? Can we have from Ms. Gliza, teacher Gliza? Yes, Ms. Hi, sir. Oh, my goodness. Actually, um, by just listening and reading and, you know, um, I it's basically a refresher for me. Yeah. And um, I kind of relate to the inclusion, inclusivity of education since I come from a mainstream school back in the Philippines. There's really um, truth behind um if you have students with, uh, uh, how they, they change the term now, right? We cannot say the. the, the yes, ma'am. Yeah. We cannot say. Uh, we cannot say mentally retarded children. We it say that be. one anymore. We used to like um, children born. with disability. Okay, yeah. even the word yes, special needs is, I think, changed also. Maybe. Yeah, because it has a negative connotation or meaning to to the students and to the parents and in terms of the classroom sir i personally have experience even here in vietnam but in vietnam um classifying or diagnosing students like them are not really common and so what we can do is probably giving them sort of um not special activity but somehow like a different kind of activity that would match to their skills. So for example, if a regular student studies five vocabulary, so if that kind of student, um, I would say does not fit to the intelligent group of um, children with disability, so might as well give at least two. So what okay. I usually do, I give the student five minutes like extension if not i for the regular students i dismiss five minutes earlier in the remaining five minutes because i have full a lot of schedule i devote the remaining five minutes to that student alone so something like that so when i heard it you know this these children are really like education for all so they are here to learn so we cannot just ignore them even though they have this kind of special needs so I don't have any questions, but I'm I'm so happy that I you know it brings back the memories and I try to reflect on the things that I should have done, I could have done, and I might do better in my in my classes or so something like that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Miss Liza. Any other questions? Kindly um, unmute your microphone if you have questions. Do we have a question from teacher Anne from Ving School?
Hello, Teacher Ang, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Probably she does not have any question. Can we have a question from, from those students from the Philippines? <laughs> I know it's already midnight in the Philippines, but in any way, okay, if you don't have any questions and if ever you still have reserved questions for those who are under TESOL Master 220 hour course, you can shoot your questions under our um, chat box in our platform. And again, please do not forget to answer the question being raised by Dr. Lino during the first you know, slide. What curriculum are you yeah. using? I hope that at this time you know what curri curriculum are you using in your respective schools. I have something in mind already. <laughs> in your respective, you know, centers. And with all of those isms, with all of those isms and isms, okay, I hope um, you already have your own personal educational philosophy, okay, out from from those philosophers and you know from 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 the from the authors of those all of those isms. Try to make your own personal educational philosophy uh -huh. because we are into this business now. Mm -hmm. We are all educators. And again, please do not forget to, again, visit your module one, module task. Your module task for module one, according to Dr. Lino, is a reflection paper. And it has something to do with uh, teaching performance and academic performance and analysis, impact, and perception. So there are references, reading references. So it's up to you. It's again, it's a self-paced. And it's modular, so it's up to you if you are so busy at this time, do not worry, okay? You all have your, your freedom as to when you are going to finish your module one. And again, um, schedules for, for um, virtual classes are already posted in our platform. So again, I would like to say thank you to everyone. And for those who are, um, you know, joining with us from, from Katie Sack International School in Laos, and for those you know students of Dr. Lino in Bangkok, Thailand, and for those who are TESOL, okay, master course um, students, again, I hope this is a very good learning experience, and I hope to see you again, okay, in our next virtual class, okay? So I have to 